The possibility of violence on Election Day has officials trying to balance safety with concerns over not wanting to intimidate voters with a visible presence at or near polling locations. While several states ban police at polls unless they are being asked to assist in a specific situation, the Wall Street Journal reports some are encouraging officers to be in close proximity as a precaution. Latasha Brown is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund, and she joins me now from Detroit. Uh, Latasha, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Talk to us about some of the historic tensions behind people of color and law enforcement officers at polling places. There is a history there. There is a history there. Thank you for having me on. You know, I grew up in Alabama. You're part of the challenges of when we're talking about voter suppression, a large part of that is based on creating this culture of fear and intimidation. And so we know historically, there have we have seen law enforcement be weaponized as a intimidation tactic, that we've seen those who have been bad actors to use that as a vehicle to deploy them around different polling sites, that instead of protecting the community and making sure that folks are safe, that it has been used in a way to really create intimidation. And so there's a long history of that. You know, even a history in the Deep South where we would challenge, where there were polling precincts that were set up and police precincts. You know, um, and because knowing the history in the black community, knowing the history of how the fun fundamentally how the police force was founded, you know, um, that grew out of slave patrols. And so we have to acknowledge and be honest about that long history and the relationship and the tension between law enforcement and voting. And then now we are in 2020, where we had the largest uprising ever, you know, across the board in this country as it relate to, related to police violence. So I think it's really important now that when we're talking about elections, we want to make sure that the polling sites are safe, but they're also free of any sense of intimidation or that the law enforcement or others will be used to weaponize or intimidate voters as they're seeking to cast their vote. And Latasha, I know that you personally waited for hours to vote in Georgia's June primary. Our CBSN political reporter, Caitlin Huey Burns, recently spoke with Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger about the steps the state is taking to address voter concerns. Here's what he had to say. If you're voting absentee, we also stood up a system called Ballot Tracks, and you can set that app onto your phone, and you can actually track your absentee ballot, you know, through the process, and then you can see if it's been accepted. You also can go to the Secretary of State's website, sos.ga.gov, and you can track and see if your ballot, absentee ballot, has been tracked. When you show up to vote in person for the first time, we have a verifiable, verifiable paper ballot. And so it will scan, and if it doesn't scan, it'll kick out right at that moment. But if it's been scanned, then you know it will be tabulated after the ballot, after the precincts close. So that has really given people that confidence. And for the first time ever, we're going to be doing a statewide audit of the races. We're standing that up in one year, actually less than one year. And so that's amazing because most states have taken five to seven years to do a statewide audit. Latasha, what's your impression of how Georgia has addressed some of the failures we saw in June? You know, while I think that those are certainly a step forward, the things that he raised were a step forward, they do not go far enough. You know, in his speaking to the reporter, he did not say that as of October 2019, he actually dropped 328,000 people from the voting rolls, that 200,000 of those 328,000 never should have been dropped. We actually had an investigative journalist and a team of experts who do d data uh, mining and data hygiene lists that sat down and literally be ran the list over and over again and discovered that 200,000 people were illegally and unjustly dropped from the voting rolls, and then it was incumbent upon them to re-register by October the 5th. We're not even certain if those people even are aware of that, which means that they fundamentally may have lost their right to vote in this particular election cycle. What he also didn't mention is that in the primary, while he, because of COVID-19, they sent out um, envelopes that were prepaid postage so that as people get the postage for, for the envelopes to make the application for the absentee ballot, it reduced a barrier. You know, in some ways, many say that it worked too well into the sense, in the sense that people actually use, utilize um, that as a, as a vehicle. Since there's been an effort to undermine the absentee ballot voting process, what we saw is this election, in the general election, he didn't send prepaid stamps. 
My organization actually is suing the state of Georgia because we see that as a poll tax. And so while there are some efforts that I must some efforts that he raised, and I think that those are good first steps what he raised, I think he also has to be accountable of how he has been dropping people from the voting rolls, how this process should be strengthened so that it doesn't disproportionately impact black voters in the state. And my question for him is, why is it in the state of Georgia, even in Metro Atlanta, of which I am a resident, why is it that the average time for a black voter is almost 40 minutes different than the average time to vote for a white voter. And so there are some fundamental structural issues that I do think are rooted in um, voter suppression that he and his office need to address, and they have not addressed. Well, let's talk about your organization. Black Voters Matter Fund works to increase representation in marginalized communities um, using tools like voter registration and, and voting rights. Where are you devoting time and resources in this final week before Election Day? So where you've caught me right now, I am, as I speak to you do this interview, I'm what we call the blackest bus, the blackest and coolest bus in America. That funding, what we have been doing <laughs> is going around, connecting with our partners. We're working with over 500 organizations, black-led grassroots groups in over 15 states that we're actually partnering with them. We're operating coordinated campaigns. We have care caravans going on in at least 32, commun 32 communities all week. We're reaching out to people while we had a phase that we're doing voter registration. Places where I am right now in Michigan, voter you can actually register and vote within the same 24 hours. And so there's still time, even in, in Michigan, for people to be able to register to vote. But some of our other states that the voter registration has been closed, we've been focusing on voter education and mobilization. And so also at the polling site, there are three things we're doing. One, in our voter education and mobilization, we've been contacting people, millions of folks through text messaging camp, our text messaging campaign and phone banking. We also, on the polls, we've been doing caravans on going into communities to let them know information around early voting. And we've also been providing comfort care at the early voting sites where we're connecting with people, we're providing snacks and water. And, so, and sometimes we're actually, we have people who are escorting elderly folks that a lot of folks in our community don't know that if you have an existing issue, um, a health issue, or you're an elderly person, you can actually skip to the front of the line. And so we've got volunteers on site that are escorting people so that they go to the front of the line to make this process as painless as, uh, as possible. What is important for us is that people have free and open access to cast their ballot, that they're operating using their agency. And this process, when we're seeing these long lines, we can't normalize that. We're doing the best that we can to address that right now. But fundamentally, we have to deal with this issue in this nation around voter suppression. Had it not been for voter suppression, what you would see is people using all of these avenues to be able to vote, whether it's mail-in voting, absentee voting, We've been talking to people in lines, and many of them are saying that they're willing to wait in line because they did not trust that their ballot would get in, right? And so I think it's really important for us to recognize that part of what we're seeing is people that are committed and determined. One thing that is really making me excited about this election cycle is that people are determined to have their voices heard. And so I'm expecting a high voter, voter turnout, but I can, challenge, I can say that what we've seen has been atrocious around the level of voter suppression. We've been in communities like Gabbleson, Texas, where there have literally been races, where there have been Republican incumbents, that their races are off the ballot so people don't even have the opportunity to vote. And it's just couched up as, as human error. We've been dealing with people who said they registered, never received their registration, people who, who have voted every single election cycle, and some way, mysteriously, they've been dropped from the voting rolls. There is a fundamental yeah. issue of voter suppression in America, and we have to deal with it. So in this last week, the best way that we think to deal with voter suppression in this week is to mobilize and have a tremendous turnout and to hold those accountable that have been bad actors and to really be able to get the kind of leadership that will be responsible to us. But in the long term, we have to do substantial structural change in the electoral system in this nation. All right. Well, Latasha Brown, I'm afraid your picture has frozen, but we certainly hear the passion and the enthusiasm in your voice. We know you're on the move. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for having me.